audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Welcome to On The Rock, God's unchanging word for changing times with Dr. Camille Majdali, Director of Teach All Nations Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Camille lived and studied in the Middle East, served as a principal of a leading Bible college and now travels the world teaching God's word. He has an extraordinary knowledge of the Bible and a dynamic ability to make God's truth come alive in a real, practical way. This episode of On The Rock will give you keys to survive and succeed in the days ahead by hearing and doing the words of Jesus. Knowledge is wonderful, but what's even more important is understanding. And even beyond understanding is wisdom, which helps you to inherit all things. In today's program, we're going to have all these things operative as we continue to learn the Gospel of Matthew. Our series is entitled, The Kingly Messiah, Understanding the Gospel of Matthew, a verse-by-verse audio commentary, part of the larger Understanding the Bible series. And we're continuing to learn God's Word because it helps us get out of the sinking sands and start to build our lives on a rock that withstands all the storms of life. Our lesson again is called Questions About John the Baptist. It's the beginning of Matthew chapter 11. Here, this whole chapter is about John the Baptist. There are other items too, but John the Baptist commended is what we learn in Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to begin with chapter 11 with this lesson, questions about John the Baptist, verses 1 to 9. And Jesus will ask questions like this, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? And what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. Jesus is speaking about John the Baptist. And what are we going to learn from all this? We're going to learn that John is the transitional character from the Law and the Prophets to Christ and the Apostles. In one sense, he's like the last of the Old Testament prophets, even though he's completely described in the New Testament. I mean, he lived in the New Testament era, and he will be given a very high commendation by Jesus. But even more important as any commendation to John the Baptist is what Jesus has to say about people who do the wise thing, the understanding thing, the knowledgeable thing, and that is to say yes to the gospel of Christ. And remember, what is the gospel? Well, it's wonderfully described in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 5, where basically it says that Christ died, was buried, and rose again on the third day for our sins, according to the scriptures. And the gospel is to be believed and received. We don't have to do anything else in order to have its life-giving, sin-forgiving, God-honoring, Christ-centered embrace take hold of our life. It is so simple that even children can take hold of the gospel. Once we have the gospel, then we enter into a whole new realm. It's called kingdom living. And kingdom living absolutely, totally outstrips fleshly, carnal living anytime, anywhere. So, Jesus asks questions about John the Baptist, and of course, he will provide amazing answers, as he always does, to these things. But I suppose what we need to focus on is, as Jesus gives attention to the very man who happened to be a blood relative of his as well, but that was incidental, this very man is given a high place of honor because he is the forerunner of Messiah. He was prophesied hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus. In his case, 400 years before was the coming of John prophesied in the book we now know as Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. 
He is the messenger that will come. He will be the voice in the wilderness. He'll talk about prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight. The rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Amazing prophecies. And of course, True to form in the Gospel of Matthew, he will look for every opportunity to illustrate that the words and actions and life of Jesus was a fulfillment of what the Hebrew prophets said centuries before. Now we want to focus on the entire passage of Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. Our lesson is called Questions About John the Baptist, the reference, Matthew 11, verses 1 to 9. And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. Our reading is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 9, and our lesson is entitled, Questions About John the Baptist. Well, we're going to teach and then preach. Actually, that's what Jesus did, Matthew 11, 1. Jesus spent time instructing his disciples, because if we're going to have a global, eternal impact We need to delegate. We can't be a one-man band. Delegation requires instruction of those who will share the load, to whom we actually delegate responsibility to. In addition, there are some points about delegation we should never forget. When you delegate a task to another, it does not absolve the leader of responsibility for that task. On the contrary, by delegating a task to another, You have enlarged your responsibility because you're now working with another person or more. Furthermore, there are some things in life you must never, ever delegate. Could you imagine an incoming president of the United States at his inauguration delegating the inaugural speech to somebody else? Or a father delegating the walking the daughter down the aisle at her wedding to another person? No way. There are just some things in life you can never, ever delegate. Now, that time of instruction has finished where Jesus was teaching his apostles who will go out in his name, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and doing mighty works in his name. After he instructed them, he departed to teach and preach in the cities of Galilee. You see, there are seasons in life. There is time for private devotion, which is something we should do regularly, even daily. There is time for private instruction as part of our preparation for service. But then there's another time for public activity and ministry. Keep that all in mind. Well, we have John the Baptist now in prison. John heard about the works of Jesus. He also had access to 
the disciples of Jesus, or his own disciples, when he was in prison, I should say, and John sent two of them to inquire of Jesus directly. Now, it appears that John the Baptist had a following that continued for years after his death. For example, we read about people who were baptized with the baptism of John in Acts chapter 19, and this would have probably been at least 20, 25 years after the ministry of John. So he was a leader, and he definitely had a great impact. Now, even though John was a man of God, he did God's will, he suffered for doing God's will, he paid the ultimate price even for doing God's will, yet in verse 3 of Matthew chapter 11, we do detect the voice of doubt. Look, even the greatest among us can have doubts, but the thing is this, we must never linger or languish in those doubts, because after all, they could draw us down. Everyone can have their temporary moments of weakness, but once they recognize it for what it is, and that is unhealthy for the soul, we need to repent of it and run back into a full committal and trust of the Lord. So, the voice of doubt, though John affirmed Christ at his baptism, He now appears to be expressing doubts. And this is very ironic because John in the prison heard the works of Christ, which were very impressive. In fact, I go further. The works of Christ that John heard of in the prison were nothing short of messianic. So he knew who Jesus was. He affirmed him as such. He's now hearing of the powerful works, but yet instead of saying, praise God, mission accomplished, He's saying, are you the one we are to look for, or do we look elsewhere? Remember, this is a righteous man who was unjustly suffering due to the unrighteous tetrarch named Herod Antipas and his wicked wife Herodias. Moments of doubt are not uncommon, and they're not necessarily terminal. They only become so when we persist in them. So Jesus, graciously but firmly, answers the question of the two disciples of John the Baptist. Matthew 11, verse 4. His immediate response to the questions of the disciples, go back and report to John everything that you hear and see. These men were also going to be witnesses of Christ's glory. Then Jesus catalogs the miracles of Matthew 11, verse 5. These aforementioned works of Christ included the following. The blind can see again. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead rise. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. What stone have I left unturned in affirming not only God's kingdom, but demonstrating God's power? How much more proof do I need to give to validate the Messianic claims. Continual demands for more proof, more confirmation, more substantiation in the face of overwhelming evidence is part of what it means to tempt God. Now, I know why I say that John the Baptist tempted God, but I'll tell you who did. The children of Israel in the time of Moses. It tells us in Numbers chapter 14, God himself testifying that this generation that came out of Egypt at the Exodus had tempted God ten times. That's ten times too many. In this case, John the Baptist only asked once, and Jesus does not rebuke him for it, and Jesus does not criticize him afterward for it, because, well, Jesus is gracious. Then there's a beatitude offered in Matthew 11, verse 6. After giving the evidence, Jesus offers this beatitude. Blessed is the person, no matter who they are, who shall not be offended in me. Jesus is the Savior, not a stumbling block. Messiah, but not a magician. Lord, not a liar. For some, Christ is the stumbling stone and the rock of offense. But to believers, he is precious. Just read that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Again, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. And Jesus starts to speak 
about John the Baptist. As the disciples of John departed from Jesus, the Lord turns to the multitude who were following him, and he now starts to ask them questions. Referring to John the Baptist, he says, What did you go out and see in the wilderness? Was it a reed shaking in a wind? After all, was John the Baptist the type of man who bent with the times? Or was he resolute in his convictions? I mean, John didn't even dress contemporary, if you read his attire. And then, you know, so many do want to bend with the wind. I do believe in being flexible, but I don't believe in pandering to the culture or trying so hard to keep up with the times. There is a phrase that says, if you seek to keep up with the times, you will go the way that all times go. Friends, we're not here to keep up with the times. We're here to prepare for eternity. And then he says in verse 8, What did you go out to see when you went to the wilderness to view John the Baptist? Did you expect to see someone in soft, fine, regal clothing? No, that's not what you get with John the Baptist. Those who wear such attire are in king's houses. And then Jesus asks it again in Matthew 11, verse 9. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? Did you go out to see a prophet? I tell you, yes, you got a prophet. But when it comes to John the Baptist, you get more than a prophet. Because you see, John the Baptist wasn't just a prophet in the normal sense of the word. John the Baptist was a fulfillment of prophecy. He is the messenger, the forerunner, who went out to make straight the way of the Lord. He is the one who God used to help identify Jesus, starting at his baptism. And as we learn, at the baptism of Jesus, described in Matthew chapter 3, not only did Jesus go into the Jordan to be baptized, not because he was a sinner that needed to confess his sins and be cleansed, but because he's the Savior that is fulfilling all righteousness, setting an example, and allowing himself to be manifest to his people and to the world, courtesy of the ministry of John the Baptist. John was able to witness what many a holy man, righteous man, prophetic man, would love to have witnessed and did not. Simeon got to see it in the temple. Anna got to see it in the temple. John the Baptist got to see it in the Jordan River, and that is the coming of the Promised One, the Messiah, the Son of David, the Son of God. John the Baptist was like, how do you call it, the weather vane, where the wind is blowing, pointing, this is the one that I said is coming after me. This is the one whose shoes, or sandals even, I am not worthy to untie. This is the one who, contrary to me, who baptizes in water, This one who's coming and is now present with us will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John was the most powerful, in one sense, of prophetic voices. It is not unrighteous to say that he is the last of the Old Testament prophets, even though he is spoken of in the New Testament. He is the, shall we say, the changing of the guard from the Law and the Prophets to the Messiah and the Apostles. Now, our lesson here is called Questions About John the Baptist. What is our lesson for life? Despite John's doubts under duress, Jesus, full of grace and truth, highly commends him. Remember to visit us at our Facebook page, Teach All Nations, Education, and thank you for liking our page. You can also go to our homepage at tan, T-A-N, dot O-R-G, dot A-U, and subscribe to the free monthly Issachar Teaching e-letter. We want to help you to become future-ready with articles about the Bible, victorious living, and current events in the light of God's Word. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for teaching us about John the Baptist. Thank you that Jesus honored this man, and he deserved the honor. He paid the price even the ultimate price, but no doubt he gains a great reward. May we all have the mindset of being faithful to the end 
so that we also can receive the crown in Christ's glorious name. Amen. Today's On The Rock was brought to you by Teach All Nations. If you would like more information about this ministry, to download podcasts, view our online store, attend special events, sign up for our teaching newsletter, make a donation to support this ministry, or to invite Dr. Camille to speak, log on to www.tan.org.au or write to us at Post Office Box 493, Mount Waverley 3149. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.